We may now, let's direct our attention to the one and only Bruno Sammartino. And Bruno, the date, uh, not all that uh, far away, actually, and I'm sure you'll be counting the days down. Well, you're not kidding, Vince, and I'll tell you, unfortunately, it, it, even though the days are not that far away, but it seems to me like it's a long, long, too far away, because I am so anxious, I'll tell you. Uh, somebody was asking me, I was talking with uh, Dominic earlier, because we were taking a workout, we were working out, and he said to me, he says, you know, you're training as if, like, it's the last week of training, because he says, uh, uh, you know, in other words, I was, he thought I was working out much too hard. This is the way that, that I can, that I can can occupy myself to let the time go by. It's by just keep training, keep thinking Zabisco. And the more I lift, the more I run, the more I skip rope, the, the better I feel. And, and it makes the time go a little bit quicker. And it makes me more ready mentally and physically. Because I want to tell you something, Vince. You know, Zabisco's been mouthing off about Bruno San Martino not realizing that fall is gone and winter is here, the winter of my career. Well, I hope that I'm not such an idiot to, not to know when the time has come to retire. But, Larry, let me tell you something. You will never be the man to retire Bruno San Martino. Never. And I'm going to show you what how heavy this winter can be on you. It's going to be so heavy that you're not even going to see ever the sign of spring again. What you going to do? You can't fight the future. Wrestling God. ProWrestlingRadio.com presents. Are you talking to me? Pro Wrestling. Radio live online. You think The Rock actually cares? What is he doing here? Oh, it's true. I'm bringing everybody with me. Be awesome. That's our time. To be the man. Call in with a question or comment. Six, one. Did you feel it? I hate your ever. Hold the damn phone. Hold for each at one eight seven seven eight hundred eight eight. Three, four. That's how I roll. Your sex at the big day. Come get some. Because I've done all of that. And now your host of the show. The king is back on his throne. Eric. Eric. Excuse me. Gar And that's the bottom line. Because Stone Cold sets so. up. Good evening and welcome to a very special edition of Pro Wrestling Radio. My name is Eric Orjulo and I'm not going to waste any time because in the last ten and a half years that I've had the privilege of doing Pro Wrestling Radio, there is one guest that people ask me about all of the time. And he is my guest this evening and I am honored to have him. He is the true living legend of professional wrestling. He is the former world heavyweight champion. He is Bruno San Martino. Bruno, welcome back to the show. Well, Eric, thank you so very kindly. You know, I always enjoy doing your show, and I thank you for uh, inviting me again uh, this evening. Oh, it's my pleasure. I mean, thinking back over the years, you must have been on my show now about 12, 13 times. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yes, I, I do think so. <laughs> well, I always ask you, and uh, the fans always want to know, how have you been? How you doing? Well, you know what? For a guy who's getting really up there in age, <laughs> I can't complain. You know, I had my share, as you know, surgeries and this and that, and I, I did my own rehab, and today uh, some people might think uh, that I'm a little crazy, but I still <laughs> train six days a week. I do three days with the iron, lifting weights, and three days I do six miles of road work. So wow. I... Uh, stay you know i try to stay as fit as i possibly can at this stage of my life yeah how are your knees with all that running over the years you know what it's amazing you know the the surgeries that i had were there was my biggest problems was the back and the hip and the knees i had some uh, surgeries but honestly the, it's like uh, like i never had any problem with them anymore they did such a good job that i i have no problem whatsoever when i do my road work so I'm very grateful for that. Oh, wow. What are your weight workouts like these days? My my weight workout? Yeah, your weight well, training? Obvi obviously, I'm not <laughs> benching 570 <laughs> pounds anymore. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you know, I, I still like go up to maybe 225 pounds on a bench press. I still use the 90-pound dumbbells on each hand for dumbbell bench presses. And I still use the 50-pound dumbbells for curls, you know. Now, of course, that's light in comparison to, you know, my heyday when I used to use the 100-pound dumbbells for curls or, like I said, over 500 pounds. But, you know, I'm, I'm not 270 pounds anymore. I'm, I'm, I fluctuate between 215 and 220. 
and keep in mind, in two months, I'll be 74 <laughs> years old. Oh, my so gosh. So, obviously, you can't uh, expect to be strong like you were, you know, all those years ago. Oh, no, absolutely. And, you know, I, w- I want to ask you, now that you brought it up, um, during your heyday as champion, when you were traveling all over the world, was it hard um, in the 60s and 70s to find gyms to work out in on the road? No, not really. Once a year, in the beginning, when I first broke in wrestling, everything was so new to me. It was a little difficult. But then as time went on, each city that you went to, even countries like in Australia, uh, there were gyms all over the place. And in Japan, you know, there was Joey Gucci. I don't know if you remember that name. Mm. I used to ask Joe, well, Joe, where's the gym that i got to work out when I'm here? And, and they would always, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, take you to a, a, a gym uh, that, so you'd know where it was. And, and uh, no, I, I, I absolutely no problem after you'd been in the business for a while. Gotcha. And uh, we're talking to Bruno San Martino, and Bruno actually uh, reissued his autobiography. It is available on www.rasslin, R-A-S-S-I-N, riotonline.com. That's rasslinriotonline.com. And Bruno, what motivated you to re-release the autobiography? You know what? I'm glad you asked me that, and I'll tell you why. I did an appearance in Boston uh, last fall. I think it was in November. And I had two people that really bothered me. A, a lady came over to me. She says, oh, Mr. San Martino. She says, oh, I'm so glad I got to you. She says, because I need for you to sign this book. She says, I bought it on eBay. And she says, I paid 95 bucks for it. Wow. And then a doctor told me paid $120 for it because when the book... You know, uh, people have these books, and they put them on eBay, and they sell them. And it bothered me a lot that that people who wanted this book, that they were paying that kind of money. So someone that I know in that business, he said to me, you know, you can uh, make a few changes on the book, add a little something there. We we added a few things in that. He says, "And, and if you put it out there, then anybody who's interested in it, they can get it, and they can get it for for a very reasonable price, which is 20 some dollar, I don't know, 22, 20, I, I forget how much, but, but instead of these 90 and 110 and 120, uh, because I honestly, I hate to see people get ripped off like that, and uh, and so uh, that's that's what brought on the decision to, to uh, make a few changes and re-release the book. Oh, okay, so how's the reaction been? Have you gotten a good reaction since you've re-released it? Yes, it's been good, and uh, not only that, but I also got some nice mail saying to me, geez, I was always looking to trying to get your book, because my book was never distributed nationwide, you know. Mm. It was just uh, uh, the guy who did it here, he he just had it here in the Pittsburgh area. Oh, wow. Yeah, they printed 10,000 books, and once they went, they wanted to print more, and I refused because I said, no, you people said that you were going to get it distributed nationwide. I knew nothing about that business, and these people evidently were trying to break into the publishing business, but they uh, weren't uh, really legitimate publishers with the proper connection and know-how to get the book distributed. So those 10,000 books, people bought them all. And I guess a lot of those people decided to put some of these books on eBay and sell them. And uh, and then I started hearing these stories about somebody paying it. Uh, you know, I, I told you one doctor, 120, yeah. this lady, 90, 95, somebody else would told me 70, 80. And I just thought that that's, that's ridiculous. And so, and anyway, that's how we came out with uh, putting it out again. Gotcha. If for, for fans that, that want to um, get their hands on the book and read the book, what do you think, or maybe what's the reaction? you've been from fans that surprised them the most something they read in the book that surprised them the most about you the most pleasant thing that i get is that they tell me that once they start reading the book that they just couldn't put it down because a lot of them just knew bruno the wrestler yeah and had no idea a lot of them that of my humble beginning uh, during world war ii when we were occupied by the uh, nazis and after the fall of Mussolini and uh, what we went through hiding in the mountains for 14 months and burying a lot of people there and I got very sick I, that uh, nobody thought I was going to survive you know I came down with rheumatic fever I was sick for over three years um, I held my family from coming to America because I couldn't pass a physical in 1947 I was too sickly and then uh, finally in 1950 I was able to pass a physical, and my dad was able to bring us over here. And so a lot of people saw me in my heyday in the 60s when I was 275. They thought, oh, I must have been a, 
a big kid from the time I was born, and that and. Uh, uh, little they knew that when I came to this country, I was 14 years old, <laughs> and I only weighed about 80, 82 pounds. Wow. And it was just sheer training of uh, both uh, wrestling and uh, and uh, weightlifting. I, t- I started with the weights first, and when I started getting uh, bigger and stronger and better, then I joined the wrestling uh, team. And, and then I had a six-day-week schedule uh, of, uh, uh, you know, wrestling on, on the mat three days a week and uh, pumping iron the other three days a week. And, and I... And then my, as I got healthier and my appetite grew and, and I was getting stronger and I was getting bigger and I was eating more. <laughs> and finally, when I broke in wrestling, I was 275. Wow. When you uh, traveled, uh, when you were in the, um, in the WWF, uh, especially in the 70s and you were doing all that traveling, did you have a, a favorite particular workout partner or wrestler that you really liked to work out with when you were on the road? I, yeah, one guy. I don't know if you remember Tony Marino. Okay. Uh, he was he, Tony was uh, was a good lifter, and uh, I worked out with him uh, uh, a good bit. Uh, uh, but you know, in this business, guy, people move on. You right. know, different <laughs> territories and that. So I basically uh, most of the times I trained by myself, like Dominic Danucci, when I'd be with him, I would work out with Dominic and, and a few other people, but I had my own, uh, believe me, I did not need anybody to push me, <laughs> I didn't need any anybody to give me any drive, because I was very, very hard worker in the gym, and I, I, I really, uh, uh, in fact, sometimes I prefer training on my own, because sometimes when you train with uh, others, you tend maybe to to talk or to do this and that. And me, I, I, when I trained, I wanted to concentrate 100% on everything that I was doing. Wow. And, uh, again, we're talking to Bruno San Martino. His autobiography is available at www.wrestlingriotonline.com. And, uh, Bruno, when you actually were, uh, tra- when you were weightlifting, before you got into wrestling, how close were you to getting into the Olympics? Actually, I came pretty close, but I was uh, uh, I was working construction. In fact, I don't know if you've ever been in Pittsburgh, but when you come from the airport and you go through that tunnel, they were, they're called the Fort Pitt Tunnel, you see the city right in front of you, And mm-hmm. but the first thing you see is the Hilton Hotel. I was working at the Hilton. We were building the uh, Hilton Hotel in uh, in uh, uh, Pittsburgh, and, uh, and you know what's tough is that when you work in construction, heavy construction, eight and sometimes ten hours a day, then you go and work out at night uh, uh, three hours or sometimes up to four hours. And unfortunately, you know, I was getting good enough for that. For the, for, uh, I was competing in both Olympic lifting and power lifting. Now, in those days, Olympic lifting, well, the three lifts, the press, snatch, and clean and jerk, that was actually Olympic competition. Power lifting had not made it to the Olympics. Mm. And, and uh, there was a, a, a tournament that we would do nationwide here. But so uh, I, I had the ambitions for uh, for the 1960 Olympics uh, is where I wanted to go. But while I was working at the Hilton Hotel, we were on the 19th floor, and we were building these beams because to, to, we were going to pour concrete. And anyway, a little accident uh, uh, happened with, uh, with somebody, long story. But anyway, mm. I got bumped, and I fell down an elevator shaft, and I went down two stories. I fell. Wow. And and I was very lucky because the uh, elevator people they were installing the elevators, uh, they had platforms because they were putting these uh, things on the on the walls, and I landed on the plywood. Otherwise, I would have gone 19 stories down. But unfortunately, when I landed at, at, at the two stories down, I broke my collarbone, and and messed up uh, my shoulder. And anyway, uh, the point is that um, for over three months or three and a half months, I couldn't do any training at all. And uh, that really messed me up. And then I was thinking maybe 64. But I had to make a living because I got married in 1959. Uh, and I, I um, you know, I, 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 when I had the offer, first I had an offer to play football for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Mm-hmm. And then came the offer for wrestling. Wrestling offered more uh, money because uh, Mr. Hart Rooney, when they wanted to take me to camp, in those days, a lot of people find this hard to believe, but uh, back in 1958-59, if you were a lineman, uh, you could make maybe $7,000 Oh, season. wow. 
Oh, yeah, and those guys, they all had jobs off-season, you know, but they were all college guys, you know. Mm -hmm. Then when the wrestling opportunity came, they told me that I could make about 30000 the first year. Keep in mind, that doesn't sound like anything today, but we're going back to 1958 or 59. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, 30000 over 7000 you know, to me was a world of difference if I wanted to help out my family, not just my, my marriage and wife, but uh, <coughs> my parents, you know, we're getting up there in age. Mm. So that's that really made my decision to uh, to go into wrestling. Wow, was uh, when you uh, when, when you when you tried out? Did you actually you you actually went through with the tryout for the Steelers or no? No, no, because when I spoke to uh, Mr. Hart Rooney and they wanted to take me to to camp that summer, I asked him right out. I says, Mr. Rooney, I said, if I make the team as a lineman, I said. Um, what can I make? And when I, like I said, when he told me I could make yeah. maybe up to up to seven thousand <laughs> a year, well, I no, I mean it's not laughable because in those days at that particular year, like a school teacher, for example, was making maybe five thousand a year. Oh wow! So it's not, yeah, it's not like uh, in the fifties that uh, that uh, would be like <laughs> such to date. They such like you know, what are you going to do with that? Yeah. No, it was a living. But uh, like I said, uh, the athletes in those days. Uh, baseball, uh, football, they all had uh, jobs off-season. And uh, my job would have been to go to construction. And I thought, man, I said, you know, playing ball, then you have to go back to that kind of work, which was dangerous work, you know, in those days working on stall buildings. So when Mr. Rudy Miller saw me on the Bob Prince show and because uh, I just won a big weightlifting tournament, and they found out, uh, as he was watching TV, he was in Pittsburgh because uh, of studio wrestling they were having here. And so he came from Washington, and, he's, and he'd come in on Friday because Saturday was the live uh, television show here, wrestling. Mm -hmm. And that Friday he happened to be uh, flicking, I guess, a different station on TV, and he saw me, well, on a guy named Bob Prince, who was the voice of the Pittsburgh Pirates. And here we were talking about this contest that I just won, and then he was asking me, Bruno, you still go up to the Pitt Field House, that's, uh, you know, University of Pittsburgh, uh, to, to, to wrestle? And I said, yeah. And when Rudy Miller heard that, he went to the studio the next day and he inquired, does anybody know this uh, a kid named Bruno San Martino? And just happened to be there. One of the guys went to school with me, a guy by the name of John Carzonis. He said, yeah. He says, the Bruno's a friend of mine. We live in the same street in the Oakland area of the city. That was the name of where we lived. Mm -hmm. And he says, could you ask him if he would come here next Saturday? I'd like to talk to him. Well, he, John Carzonis contacted me following Saturday. I went there. When Rudy saw me, he seemed impressed. You know, my size and how I looked physically, you know, to 275 pounds, I think, you know, I looked pretty good because I was training so darn hard. And he offered me to come to Washington. He wanted some people to see me. And the people who, won, who he showed me to was Vince McMahon Sr. and Toots Mond. Mm. They were the promoters. And uh, they uh, asked me if I'd be interested. And I asked the same thing I asked him for football. I said, well, what can I make? And they said, well, the first year, we can almost guarantee you that you'll do around 30000 Well, like I say, in those days, that was a pretty good, uh, you know, uh, money. Sure. And so I, I thought, you know, hey, that sounds great. So I said, yeah, I'll give it a shot. And next thing I know, I came home. I told my wife. I told my, my boss at the, at the Hilton where I was working at the time that I wanted to try this out. And then I came to Washington, and I trained for two months. And then I start getting the preliminary matches here and there. And that's how it all began. Wow. And again, we're talking to uh, the legendary Bruno Sammartino. And Bruno, you know, I, I, we always talk about this. And I have to ask you, when I do radio shows and I'm interviewed and people know that you come on the show often, they ask me, do you think Bruno is going to go into the WWE Hall of Fame? And I say, absolutely not. I said he tells me that every time he comes on the air. So I have to ask you, any uh, progress with the WWE Hall of Fame? No, there's no contact at all between me and them. They they don't they don't ask anymore, and and, uh, and I don't I'm not in touch with anybody in that organization at all. Um, you know, uh, the funny thing is, I get some mail. I get mail all the time. I guess nowadays, I'm not the, when it comes to computers and stuff. Eric, <laughs> you're talking to the biggest dummy. I don't know because I never fooled with that. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know how to use them or anything, but. Um, uh, today, um, uh, I get a lot of uh, uh, mail that, that comes here, 
every day I get mailed in, and then through computers or internet or whatever, they get, they all get your address. It's mm. like everybody has your address, and so uh. people write me now. This is this is true. Uh, I would uh, say that maybe two out of twenty uh, <laughs> of uh, letters and whatever I get, they tell me stuff like. You know, Bruno, you're being stubborn. You're not being fair to the uh, fans who supported you. They said, you know, you should go into the Hall of Fame regardless of your feelings about with McMahon and this and that. And they said, because you owe it to the fans to go to the Hall of Fame. And I think by not going, you're being disrespectful to the fans. But then I get the majority of the, uh, and I kid you not, I, like I say, out of 20, I maybe mean, I get two what I just said. But the others say, hey, you know, Bruno, we respect you for standing by what you believe, and we're behind you, and uh, and, and so forth. Very, very supportive. Uh, the people that uh, feel that I'm doing an injustice to the fans, you know, in a way, I feel bad that they think that way. Mm. But if they only thought about it, in all honesty, what is the WWE Hall of Fame? Is there? a building that uh, they can go and take their kid or whatever to the Hall of Fame to show them this and that. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It's all, of, it, all it is is that when they have the WrestleMania, they have the Hall of Fame the day before, and uh, and then uh, they make DVDs and McMahon, which it's, it's, you know, I'm not knocking him for this. It's business. And he sells those DVDs all over the world, and they make a lot of money yeah. uh, from it. But that's what, and then, and how do you get picked for the Hall of Fame? Well, they decide. They say, well, let's see, who do we want this year? Let's pick so and so and so and so. Look at some of the people in it. Refrigerator Perry. Yeah, they have a limo. The they have a limo driver in there. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, Dudley was a very nice fellow. I, I knew Dudley he was uh, more or less a, a, you know, a gopher for Vince McMahon Sr. in Washington. A nice guy. But, you know, that's right. That's uh, what he did. And then you have Pete Rose. He's in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> I mean, if people thought about it, come on, what kind of an Hall of Fame is that? Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. You know, I have a, a chat room open, and I have some fans in there that are asking questions that they would like me to ask sure. you. And one question that popped up is, uh, and, you know, I don't think I ever asked you about this, uh, this name in particular, Herb Abrams. You worked for Herb Abrams a little bit, uh, the UWF, and Herb seems – like he was a little bit of a crazy character. What are your memories of Herb Abrams? Well, my, well the, the, I, I, I'd never heard of him before, and he contacted me. I don't know through whom or what, but anyway, I got a call from him saying that he was starting a new league in California and that he knew that I was disillusioned about some of the things, but he was going to, and he went on to say what he was going to do and not do, and he says, and I would like to have you do uh, commentating for me, you know, and and I thought, you know, hey, give it a shot, because any time I, I heard somebody who wanted to bring back wrestling the way it used to be, mm -hmm. that was always music to my ears, and yeah. if I could help at that time, of course, and we're going back now to 1990, 1991, so, uh, you know, it was a long time ago, about 18, 19 years ago, and so I did, I went to California, and I saw his shows and that, and uh, it wasn't uh, 100% of what I thought it might be, this and that, but he started bringing in a lot of really good names, he had Steve Williams, mm -hmm. he brought in Orndorff, uh, he had uh, John Tolis, uh, not wrestling, but uh, as a manager, and and um, you know, many, many a lot, a lot of good talent. But uh, I, you know, he he had his own ideas, and and yeah, so you heard he was crazy. I thought he was a good guy, but he was a little bit uh, uh, stubborn in the sense that he had his ideas, even though he had very little experience in, in wrestling. But yet he was one of these guys who thought he knew a lot more than he actually did. Yeah. And eventually, you know, I, 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 he was always good with me. I could never say anything bad or negative about him. But I, I just saw that things were not going to be what I had hoped they were going to be. And eventually I just, uh, you know, about part of company, but in a very friendly way. Sure, sure. Um, you know, something else I, I wanted to ask you. When you, um, when you traveled... Uh, around a lot, obviously outside of the WWWF area. Did you ever play a heel anywhere that you went? You mean here in the States? Uh, either here in the States or Europe or Canada, Japan? 
Oh, well, in Japan, you were always the, the bad guy as far as the Japanese were concerned because you always wrestled the most popular <laughs> Japanese guys. Right. You know, when you wrestle like Shohai Baba, whom I always wrestled, every time I went to Japan, uh, traveling all over Japan, he was the guy that, the, you know, that I always uh, would wrestle. And naturally, uh, he was such a big, uh, a big hero in Japan that uh, whether it be me or <laughs> no matter who, yeah. uh, you're going to be the bad guy, you know. That's all there was to it. But did I actually go and try to be a villainous type of guy? No. Yeah. No, I never did that anywhere. Yeah. Did you have a good time? Like, I, I remember actually, now that you mentioned Baba, I remember seeing a long time ago on the Internet there was an interview with you from Japan, from from a match that you had uh, right before you were going to wrestle Baba, and I guess since you know the fans were more behind Baba, you kind of came off more like a villain in the interview, but not so much. Did you have did you have, did you have fun doing those kind of interviews over there? Well, the fact that the, you know it was Japan, it was Baba's the big deal, and all that kind of stuff, which he was. Hey, we were going to wrestle in a stadium, and so naturally I had to uh, do my part <laughs> yeah. to uh, try to fill that place. So I think you're referring to the time when they were interviewing me and about Baba this and that, and and I said, well, I said, um, sorry to say, but when I wrestled Baba. Uh, there's going to be a lot of tears from the Japanese yeah. audiences because I'm really going to do them in. Uh, something to that effect. I can't remember word by word by what I said. Yeah, but I did kind of a strong villainous type interview because uh, we were going to be in a pretty good-sized stadium. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, sometimes that sells tickets. Wow. You know, I actually uh, sat down and did an interview with uh, Ivan Koloff uh, a few months back. And um, Ivan was talking about after, um, you know, he, he beat you for the title and he had such a short title reign and then Pedro Morales came and took the title within a couple of months. And he was saying at the time that he was led to believe that he was going to have a long title reign and that, um, you know, he would have a chance to at least run with the belt. Did you think when you dropped the belt to Ivan that he was going to have a longer run? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I didn't think he would have uh, years. Yeah. But I thought maybe a year or close to it. I never expected, you know, to be just a couple of weeks, whatever it was. Uh, no, nah, that was, uh, the, the, nah, I, I don't know if anybody uh, expected that. I sure did not. Yeah. And uh, I, I saw an interview that George the Animal Steel did uh, a couple of years back, and he said that you were pretty instrumental for uh, giving him a big breakdown in Pittsburgh. Who's this now? George Steele. Oh, well, I was wrestling, I wrestled in Detroit. Mm -hmm. I was wrestling the Sheik in Detroit, and I seen this guy, he had a mask on, and he wrestled, I think, as the student, if I'm not mistaken. And I saw he was a big guy, over 300 pounds, and so uh, uh, I inquired about him, who is this guy? And they said that he was a teacher, he coached football and wrestling in uh, a school in, uh, around Detroit, mm -hmm. and he only wrestled on uh, weekends. Uh, uh, and so I inquired about him, uh, and then I got to here in Pittsburgh, and I talked to Rudy Miller and a guy named Freeman. I says, call up uh, this guy, and I told him who, and see if you get some dates on this guy, because I think this guy can make a, a pretty good opponent over here. Yeah. Uh, but at that time, he was different. You know, before, the was it the green tongue yeah. and all the faces? He wrestled, you know, he did more wrestling and stuff like that, and and frankly, uh, I wish that he would have stuck more to that style. But hey, who am I to say? Maybe, maybe uh, becoming the George the Animal Steel that he became, maybe that, that that worked better for him. I don't know, you know. Right. But he was a big, burly guy, and I thought, you know, he he would be a good opponent. Wow. And uh, recently, I read somewhere that you were supposed to be at an, uh, a mixed martial arts show in, in Pittsburgh. Was there any truth to that? Well, yeah, but what happened was that, uh, I'll tell you, I, yeah, you, I don't know if you knew or not, uh, Eric, but I was in Europe, you know, my wife and I celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. Yes, congratulations. And, thank you. And while we were over Europe and back to Italy and all that, uh, uh, they, uh, somebody from there talked to my son who was here and that uh, asked my son if I would make an appearance because they were going to have uh, one of those... Uh, uh, you know, uh, shows here in Pittsburgh at the uh, Mellon Arena, which used to be the Civic Arena. And Danny, you know, my son Danny said, uh, geez, I can't uh, promise anything because my dad's uh, away in Europe. Said, but, 
uh, I, you know, so he said, when he comes back, I'll be happy to ask him. So when I came back, <clears throat> um, my son Danny told me about the conversation he had with this fella, and I said, well, who is he? Is he the promoter? Because to be honest with you, Eric, I don't know too many people in, 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 who promote that, uh, who the promoters are or where they're from. I, you know, I, I'm, I just don't follow much of anything anymore when it comes to wrestling and uh, the martial arts. Sure. Or, or, so uh, anyway, um, uh, he say he told me who the guy was. But anyway, he said to me, "Dad, he says, why don't you go?" He says, uh, "He said, you know, he invited uh, me and Daryl, Daryl's my uh, my other son. He said to go and it might be fun, you know, to see this and all of us being together." So I said to Danny, I said, "Well, if you guys want to go, I said then okay, I I'll go." So he told this guy, "Okay." Then uh, there's a fellow named John Babinsack who writes. He's a writer. Mm -hmm. And he was hired, and I know this fellow, good guy. And he really knows the history of wrestling, too, by the way. He got contacted by the promoter. I, feel, I wish I could remember the guy's name. But anyway, Todd, Todd Zimmerman or something. And he said uh, uh, if he would do a program for him, write some stories about these guys. Mm -hmm. So this guy, John Babinsack, says, I understand that Bruno San Martino is making an appearance. Should I write something down on that, too? And the promoter, he said, Bruno, he says, no, I didn't hear anything about Bruno appearing here. Huh. He says, this is the first I hear of it. Wow. Well, when this uh, Joe Babinsack called me up and he said to me, Bruno, he says, I was talking to the promoter, he has no knowledge that you're going to be there. What's going on? And I said, well, I don't know who, <laughs> I'm telling you what my son told me. So I told my son, after I got off with Babinsack, I said, hey, whoever this guy is that's making all these uh, promises, uh, you know, these uh, things about the invitations and that, I said, the promoter knows nothing about it. Yeah. I says, I don't appreciate that. I said, this show's in two couple, two, three days. I heard this show advertised, but I never heard my name mentioned once. So I said, you know, this is crazy. So anyway, I told Danny, I said, you, you get a hold of this guy, whoever he is, and you tell him to forget about it, that I will not go there. I said... They're announcing a special guest, this uh, Kurt Angle, I think, and the guy from the Steelers, uh, a kicker named uh, Jeff Reed. Mm. I says, my name is not mentioned once. So I says, no, I'm not going to go. So anyway, I, I, I pulled out. Mm. Uh, I, and that's why I pulled out, though, because, hey, if the promoter doesn't know you're supposed to be there, come on, what kind of a deal is that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you, have you watched any of the mixed martial arts or anything on TV or anything like that? You know what, Eric? I watched it once uh, in a little bit another time. I, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I, no, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a guy who watches a lot of that stuff. But I, I heard so much about it that I did watch it uh, for about an hour one night. And another time, because somebody, one of my sons wanted me to see a particular guy, and I watched for another 15 minutes on a different day. But uh, no, am I a guy who watches it on a regular basis? No, I don't. Gotcha. And uh, I read a story recently on uh, about you that you uh, sparred once or a few times with Sonny Liston. Oh uh, no, that, one time, and that was in 1957. Uh, not a few times, <laughs> just one time. Okay, what happened? Well, I, I was uh, when when uh, the wrestling season was over. The, the Y where I used to train with the weights, they also had a mat uh, and, and a ring, I should say, where they uh, had three days a week they would uh, uh, do boxing, and three days a week it was would be for us on the mat to work out, you know, wrestling. And there was the, the boxing coach, who was a guy by the name of Al Quayle, who was a tremendous uh, fighter in his heyday. He was a top contender as a light heavyweight, he never quite made it to the top because we had a guy named Billy Kahn at the time who was the big gun, you know? Yeah. So, but Al Quayle was a terrific guy, and he used to watch me work out, and he said to me, you know, he said, I'm just watching you with that wrestling stuff. He says, you really have fast hands and that. He said, did you ever try, think of trying boxing? I said, no. I said, I like boxing. I'm a fan. I watch it on TV and that. I said, but no, I never. He says, why don't you try it. Why don't you let me work with you a little wee bit? And I said, nah, I don't know. I like wrestling and weightlifting. Yeah. And he says, what do you got to lose? You know. Anyway, long story is, uh, he was such a nice guy, and uh, you know, I was young, and, and he, uh, 
uh, I, I, I like not to offend him. And I said, okay. So I started working on it. He started having me a little shadow boxing in the bag and skipping rope and all that kind of stuff. And before I know it, he starts sparring with uh, a few guys. And he thought that uh, what he was impressed most about was that the, my ability to take uh, a <laughs> punch. <laughs> wow. I, I could take pretty good blows and not go down or be too uh, affected by them. And that impressed him. And he said to me, he said, you know, he says, anybody who could take shots like I've seen you take here and not to even flinch, he said, that if, if you could be taught the, the proper, you know, skills, he said, you know, you, you, you could really do something. So he said, I have a connection in New York. He says, I let, you got nothing to lose. He says, I want them to look you over, see what, what they think. Uh, anyway, long story, we go to New York. Mm -hmm. uh, they flew me to New York, and uh, Sonny Liston, whom I didn't know anything about him at the time, absolutely nothing. He had been in jail, and he was out of jail, and he was in Stillman's gym working out, and there was a priest with him that uh, I don't know the whole story, but he was kind of there to keep him straight, and because evidently <laughs> he had been in trouble uh, in his young days. I, I don't know the whole story, but anyway... So I knew nothing about him. So anyway, they, they, they put me in a ring with him to spar. And to be perfectly honest with you, Eric, you know, I was throwing punches, uh, wild and stuff, but uh, obviously he, he, he was uh, more skilled because evidently he had had some back, uh, you know, he, he had been training for some time so with boxing and that, even before he went to jail. But like I said, just because I didn't know him, but the skills were there. And, and he would counter. And he, and he, and he, and he <laughs> to be honest, you know, he hit me a lot of times, and I don't think I ever nailed because I was thrown punches all over the place, but he was uh, blocking and countering and so forth. And uh, so they came with the conclusion that I needed a lot, a lot of work to, to, <laughs> to, to, to be a boxer. But they were impressed that I could take uh, really good shots. So they wanted to get me a job at the shipyards and during the day to make a living, and then at night I'd be training at Stillman's gym. And then I had to really speak up, and I told the uh, hell quail who had flown up there with me, I says, look, I says, I could never be really good at this. I says, because this is not what my heart's at. I says, I love two sports, wrestling and weightlifting, and I want to continue with those two. I will not give up weights because one thing that I was told at the time, you had to give up weightlifting altogether wow. if you were going to train for boxing. And I said, uh, no, I, I, I will not do that. I love the competition because I, I compete in both Olympic lifting and power lifting. Yeah. And that did not interfere with wrestling, you know, as for that kind of training. And so with that, you know, that that uh, that was the end of my <laughs> boxing career. Oh, wow. Uh, and again, we're talking to Bruno San Martino, and his autobiography is available now at www.wrestlingriotonline.com. Dot com and uh, I have some more questions coming from the the chat room here and I guess this is a little bit of a hypothetical um, John from the chat room asked if the WWE or WWF during your time if they had some kind of a wellness or drug policy uh, during the 70s with steroids or anything like that do you think a lot of the guys would have been suspended um, you know what I'm sure there were some, uh, obviously, yeah. but I don't think there were that, that many. I really don't believe so. Uh, it was in the late 70s that I first started seeing that, you know, that Dr. Zaharian who wound up in jail eventually? Yes. He came around to the t where we did the TV, at least where I was, which was Allentown and Hamburg. That's where we were doing the TV back then, and I was doing color commentating with uh, Vince McMahon, Jr., and uh, over there, uh, I, I would see maybe seven, eight guys uh, go to him and whatever they were getting. And at the time, yeah, we all felt that, uh, that uh, that's what it was, that it was the steroids that he was supplying with these guys. But again, uh, it didn't seem like there were a whole lot of guys then. Yeah. What I saw as a lot of guys was that when I retired in 1981, when I came back at the latter part in September, I guess, of 1984, that's when I saw, when Junior had taken over the whole thing, that's when I, I saw, you know, it was ridiculous. It looked like 
uh, look like everybody. You yeah. know, in fact, I said that somebody asked me, how many uh, guys do you think are on steroids? I said, it's got to be 95%. And Billy Graham, who was one of them, he laughed, and he says, try 99.5%. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, that's it. so so I mean it really exploded uh, uh, in my opinion at that time. Yeah. Uh you know I I think there are a lot of people out there that that don't know the full story behind how you got Larry Zabisco into the wrestling business and you know people see it on TV and they don't know whether you know what's fact or what's fiction but you actually really did get Larry Zabisco in the wrestling business, correct? Yeah, Larry it was here from Pittsburgh and I didn't live too far from me. Uh, when he was a kid, he was uh, he, he wrestled in junior high, and then he was wrestling for a, a school called North Allegheny. They were one of the best wrestling programs in the country. They were very well known. Uh, North Allegheny they had a great coach named Augustine, who was considered to be one of the top high school wrestling coaches in the nation. Anyway, Larry he, uh, was a big fan of mine, which and I didn't know who he was. He, whenever I'd come home on a Sunday, it seems like, I don't know if he was by <laughs> around here, uh-huh. but he would always catch me and I'd come over. Mr. San Martinez, you know, my name is uh, Larry and I'd like to be a wrestler someday and could I work out with you this night? And I'd say, hey, hey kid, you know, like uh, I'm never home. I'm, uh, you know, I'm come home every two weeks to see my family and that but every time i'd come home he he would he would uh show up somehow yeah and then he said to me when, when like he said to me well can i work out with you uh, with the weights a little bit because i i don't know what i'm doing and so i said okay when i work uh, if i'd work out on a day that i was here I, i'd let him work out with me and then he would tell me about his wrestling and and so you know as time went on I got to know him more and more and just start working out with him more and more and uh, he was very talented uh, wrestler no question about it he had uh, he he really was good at the school that he went to and he was one of the top uh, wrestlers there and then he told me he wanted to be a wrestler and his parents contacted me he says you know he idolizes you and he wants to be like you but we want him to go to school we we have an opportunity here to get him in college and and so I, I, I had a good talk with him, uh, knowing his parents' wishes, and I said to him, I said, you want to become a professional wrestler, I'll help you, but first you have to get a college degree. You get a college degree, and I'll help you get into professional wrestling. He was very disappointed. He didn't want to go to college. He wanted to go into wrestling. Mm. So I told him that's the only way I would help, because I knew that would make the parents you know, feel better. So he did go to college, and he wrestled four years in college, I think he went to uh, Lehigh and Penn State. I'm not sure. I think that's where he, I forget which one he went first and then the other one second. Uh, he went to two different colleges. <clears throat> anyway, the parents thanked me much because of, uh, you know, for, for you know, to, to do that uh, so he would go to college. And then, but when he got out of college, <laughs> he came right over and he says, yeah, he says, I got, graduated. He says, no, nah. he says, you told me that he, and so at, uh, you know, I said, well, what I told his parents about it, and they said, well, they said, at least he's got his degree, yeah. so if he wants to try it, you know, and that was the main thing. And so I, I, I trained him. I had some guys here, local guys, because I was still on the road, to work out with him on a regular basis, and he trained and he trained. And when he, I thought he was good enough, I sent him to Portland, Oregon, a small territory, you know what I mean? Yes. To, to get some good training in. From there, I forget where else, Oklahoma, and then sent him to Florida, and then brought him into New York. Gotcha. So that's how he started. That's a, and he was very, very talented. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, uh, Bruno, as as somebody like yourself that you know you you, you tried walking away from the business, um, you know many times, and you've you've talked about being brought back in, not not you know against your own will, um, you know during uh, the Vince McMahon Jr. period. Um, does it surprise you when you see a guy like Ric Flair who's sixty years old and he just won't walk away? Yeah, well, you know, everybody's uh, an individual, and I don't know what's uh, Ric Flair's mind. You know, I don't know. Him. Can I say something about Ric Flair? Sure. If I may? Sure. Somebody said to me, somebody heard me say something negative about him and said, how come? You, you know what, Ric Flair, I never said anything negative about Ric Flair for years. But in the last couple of years, yeah, I have been negative on Ric Flair, and I will tell you why. I ignored the different things that he said about me. For example, 
He said that uh, San Martino, the only place he means anything is in New York. And what's the big deal? Nine, nine million people, I think he said, there. He says, I could sell out uh, Madison Square Garden when I'm 55 years old. Now, this is about 25 years ago he made these kind of remarks. Yeah. I let it go. I, I, I just didn't respond to that. Then later he said again, he says that I didn't mean anything anywhere, just in, in New York. And again, I let it go. Uh, but then he uh, wrote in his book uh, saying some derogatory things from what I understand, not that I ever read his book. And then I caught him some here in Pittsburgh where I guess he thought I read the book, which I did not. And, and when I had that famous meeting, you remember, you yep. know about with McMahon. Yep. I saw him in the corner of my eyes, and I actually started walking toward him to say hi. And when he saw me, he turned around and he took off. Later, he said on a radio sh uh, thing or somebody that he tried to come and shake my hand, and I turned my back to him. And that was uh, that. Then it, that that was almost the, 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 the you know the the straw, as yeah. the old saying goes. And then I I, I resented, and then I I I did uh, you know hit me once, uh, hit me twice, but then I'm going to hit back. And anybody who knows me knows that I won't take too much of that. So then I did. I said to him. Who is this? Here's a guy who talked about that uh, population in New York. Well, what happened when they brought him in? Where they were going to set the world on fire with him and Hogan? Do you remember that? Absolutely. They bombed. Uh, yep. What's his name? Was one of the the the, the matchmakers. Then you know the program directors was J J Dillon. I yep. don't know if you read his book, but he himself told me how they had to change the whole program because they were shocked, They're so disappointed. They went to Madison Square Garden. They drew nine thousand people. That's a disaster. Wow. And the, and they had to cut the program. They were going to have them like three shows, and they had one show. I'm I'm not sure if they ever had a second. I, I don't know. But Boston, everywhere they went, so they, they killed the program because they were drawn so poorly. Yeah. So here's the point. I never, I knew Ric Flair when he was working out of the Carolinas. I would never say, well, Rick draws in Charlotte, but he doesn't draw any place else. How the heck did he know my, my, my career, my schedule every night when I'm wrestling all over, what I was doing for him to... To, to make a stupid remark like that. And I thought, who is this guy to be critical of anybody? Here's a guy who 25 years ago was kept out of jail by Jim Crockett Sr. because he hadn't paid taxes in years, and they were going to put him away. Yep. He, Crockett worked out a deal with the government to, to pay him off. This is the same guy who recently did the same thing, and McMahon had to work out the same deal with the guy. This is a guy who had a lawsuit for exposing himself on plane with the airline stewards. I'm sure you heard of that. Of course, absolutely. I'm saying to myself, who is this guy to go picking on people, criticizing people? What, with, with his uh, track record? I said, you know, give me a break. Why is he wrestling at 60 or trying to us? Because... Uh, uh, you know, in my day, nobody made a lot of money, you know, because, you know, pr uh, prior to all this explosion that happened in sports. And that goes for baseball, football, wrestling, you know, hockey. They're all making big bucks today. But back in those days, whether it was football, baseball, football, nobody made a, a whole lot of money. I mean, we made a very, very good living. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But he, he stayed in long enough to where the time where the big money came in, you know, with the Ted Turners, the, the, and and from what I hear, and I don't know his affairs, he has to wrestle because he was one of these guys who did ridiculous, foolish things and squandered his money all the time. I guess he thinks that maybe you don't get old or that, or, or that, uh, that kind of money will keep coming forever, yeah. but it doesn't. So I think at 60 years of age, with the obligations, because he's been married, what, three, four times? Right. He has, he has alimony, so probably, I don't know if he has child support, but... When you have these kind of commitments, and I understand, I don't know if he's paid the, I, the IRS, but I know that they were taking so much out of his pay to take care of that. So I, I guess that he needs to keep going in order to keep his head above waters with all the foolish uh, moves that he's done. So the bottom line is, hey, Rick, don't go knocking, criticizing people when you live the kind of life you've lived. Yeah, yeah. What do you remember? Because uh, you actually refereed a couple of his matches in WCW. I refereed him about five times, and it was just like if you went to a uh, play. <laughs> uh, that's why I said that Ric Flair, uh, people can say all they want what a great uh, performer he is. There's no question. He was always a hard worker. 
He took a lot of hard blows. There's no question. I would never take that away from the guy. Mm -hmm. But what I do take away from him is that the five matches that I that I refereed at that time, it was like watching a play it, it, from beginning to end. All five matches were absolutely identical. Mm. Uh, did you ever uh, wrestle? Very repetitious. Wow. Did you ever uh, wrestle uh, Antonio Anoki over there? Oh, yeah. In Japan? Not a lot of times. Okay. And uh, I, I think I, I read a story recently that there was a match where he, he tried to get cute with you in the ring a little bit. Yeah, he had been training under Carl Gotch, and I guess he thought he was what they call a, a hooker or a shooter or whatever. Yeah. And he did. And he took me down. He put me in a, in a pretty, very awkward. He, he put me... He, he, um, uh, he, he chicken winked me uh, with a front face bar, as we call it, and all of a sudden I realized he meant business. He really, really was putting on the juice. I powered my way out of it, and I nailed him pretty good. He, like a coward, he went out of the ring, and for the rest of the the match, it was of course it was Baba was his tag team partner. He wouldn't come in the ring. I only wrestled with Baba for the rest of the the, the night. Uh, he would not uh, uh, come back in the r in rank. He would only go with my 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 tag team partner, and so I, I lost all respect for the guy. And so Carl Gotch later, and God rest his soul, because I like Carl, but he he said some weird things. He said that I killed Osaka. That that happened in Osaka in mm -hmm. in a field in a ballpark. Okay. And uh, my God, I wrestled in Osaka many many times after that. Because, see, what happened was Inaki and Baba were tag team, but I didn't know, because who understand, you know, Japanese, yeah. I didn't understand uh, anything there, what was going on. What was happening was that they were, sh he was going on his own, and I was uh, friends uh, with the organization of Baba, and, and I think they thought that if he could double-cross me and make me quit or something like that, that that would make the news all over, and then I would not have the same value as an opponent for Baba for future shows. Mm. And, and that's what I believe then uh, happened there. But, of course, uh, as you know, they split, and uh, uh, they had their own organizations, and I continued to go with Baba, and they kind of put uh, Vince McMahon in an awkward situation. I'm talking about senior, not junior. Okay. Because he later became a supplier for talent for Inaki. And naturally, uh, I would never have anything to do with Inaki after that because I had no respect or use for him, whereas Baba was a very honorable man. Baba was a very honorable man. And so uh, I committed that I would go with Baba's organization. And then um, when Vince McMahon, uh, I don't know how much later, maybe a year, two years later, he became the, the, the guy who would book the talent for Inaki from the States here. Mm -hmm. And so he approached me that it made him look bad that he was the booking talent for Inaki, but I was going for Baba. And I reminded him that I had committed to Baba way, way before he ever committed to Inaki. So I said, you know, I, I, I have to keep my word, too. He's been a very honorable guy with me. And so it was always a little bit of a friction about that because he felt it made him look bad as the promoter and that he more or less couldn't control me, you know. But, yeah. uh, hey, you know, you, you, you commit, you commit. And that's the way I looked at it, and that's what happened. Was there a story? I, I, I heard you telling some, some story like this, and, and correct me if I'm wrong because I'm probably wrong, that there was a time when you traveled up to Canada, and I might be wrong here, but I think it was Gene Sinitsky where he was another one that tried to get cute with you in the ring? No, no, not Gene Sinitsky. It was a guy named Shumway. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, big guy, uh, Shumway was his name, and that happened in uh, Hamilton, Ontario. And um, again, I, I, I guess maybe I had luck on my side. He tried to, try to cross me pretty good in the ring. But he wound up flat on his back and completely out and unconscious. I, I, I did a real good number on him. Wow! Wow! Yeah. Um, I mean, Shumway. Okay. Who was it? Was there a guy or maybe two um, over the years in the '70s or even the '60s that you had thought would be perfect to be the next champion in the WWF, whether it was a heel or uh, a baby face that just never got the break that you thought he was going to get? Oh boy, you know what? Good question, but I I don't know if I ever ever thought about that. Mm. Uh, I I don't know that I can answer that. Uh, I thought Mario Milano had he been around long enough because Mario was a good-looking guy, <laughs> hmm. about six foot. I don't know. Do you remember him? About six foot four, uh, good-looking athlete. I think that was before wrestler. my time. I don't remember that name. 
Oh, you don't remember Mario Milano? Mm -hmm. He's from Australia. Okay. Uh, yeah, I thought he was a uh, pretty, uh, you know, good guy. Uh, the reason why I would never pick a villain to be champion, and I will tell you, and I've said this before, a lot of people don't understand it. Uh, Buddy Rogers, okay, everybody knows Buddy and I w were never friends. We were enemies. Mm -hmm. but, but the truth is the truth. Buddy was a, had a great presence in the ring. When you looked at Buddy Rogers, it, the, the things that were impressive about him, number one, he was always in good shape. I mean, he didn't look like a steroid freak like you, you've seen later on. Yeah. But I'm talking about a very good body. You know what I mean? Good yeah. athletic body in that ring. He, he, looked, he looked very, very well. He had a great presence to him with that blonde hair, but not hanging down to his back, you know, neatly combed. And he always had that sparkling... Uh, 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 jacket, you know, that uh, Buddy Rogers like. And when he strutted in that ring, there's no question about it. The guy was great. And when he performed, he was a great, great performer in the ring. Mm. But here's the problem. Uh, why guys like him even don't last long. Because you see, to have to when you have to wrestle in Madison Square Garden or in Philadelphia or in Baltimore or Pittsburgh, whatever, every three weeks or every four weeks, month after month and year after year. You have to have opponents. It's a lot easier to create a, a, a villainous opponent. For example, if I'm the champion, Bruno San Martino, okay, and I'm look upon as the good guy. Well, you know, a guy gets on television, whether it be Killer Kowalski, whether it be uh, Koloff, Bobby Duncan, uh, Waldo Von Eric, who just passed away, by the way. Mm -hmm. If they get on TV and they're taking on some very, you know, a, a mediocre opponent, say, and they go through this guy, smash him up and down, it's like, this is what I'm going to do to San Martino. It would be really easy for the people to get to hate that guy and to have him wrestle me because with the hope that I'm going to take care of him. You know yeah, what I mean? Absolutely. But when you have a, but when you have a villain champion like, a, like a, a, a Buddy Rogers or anybody that was really good, it's difficult to get a, a, a good guy to go in the ring to have a regular match because he can't go out there and be obnoxious by kicking, stomping, <laughs> beating the heck. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Therefore, therefore, it takes a lot longer, a lot longer to create that guy to be a, 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 a serious opponent for a Buddy Rogers. And you can't create him quick enough to keep coming up with these opponents for the guy. Mm. You understand? And that's yes. why even greats like Buddy Raj could never last a long time in a particular area, not as a headliner. He couldn't, and he never did. Wow, wow. And, uh, again, we're talking to the great Bruno Sammartino. You can get his autobiography at www.wrestlingriotonline.com. Uh, Bruno, when I had uh, superstar Billy Graham on the show, uh, we were talking about some of his favorite memories wrestling here in Philadelphia, and he immediately talked about the steel cage match that the two of you guys had, and he talked about something like 5,000 fans being turned away at, 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 from the building that night and just how crazy the atmosphere was, and I was able to come across a video, and I, and I saw it, and it was just absolutely tremendous. What do you remember about that night and the atmosphere of that match? Well, you know what, you know, like so many other opponents I've had, I wrestled Billy a lot of times. I wrestled him, of course, Madison Square Garden two, three times, and Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, Boston, you name Pittsburgh, everywhere. Yeah. So it's hard to remember each different city because especially when you wrestle him two, three times each place. But I do remember having a cage match with him in Philadelphia. And, of course, yeah, as far as uh, because it was a cage match after we had wrestled uh, the month before, regular match, and I don't remember what happened that brought us into the cage. But, uh, yeah, the, the people, obviously, very much on fire, very responsive, uh, very exciting. You know, I mean, it was, uh, there was no question about it. And, and the, the match was hot. Uh, and I don't know if it turned away 5,000 people, but uh, I know in a lot of places, especially with Zabisco, we turned away thousands of people. Oh, wow. And with Billy, um, that was a pretty hot, because he took the title from me in Baltimore, so naturally when we had return matches, and people, I don't know, I guess we're hoping I take the title match back, uh, take the belt back, uh, they, were, they were always extremely responsive in all these places, and, 
and there's no question Philadelphia, you know, that was one of my favorite towns. We did real well in Philadelphia, and I'm sure that uh, what I remember, the crowd went absolutely bananas. Wow. Uh, but then they were angry because uh, when I threw him <laughs> across that cage and he went against the door and the door flipped open yes. he went outside the ring and he was the winner because he was the first outside <laughs> of the cage. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, we talked about this the other day when we spoke on the phone, but I thought the fans would really enjoy uh, hearing your insight about this. During your final run of matches in the WWF at the time, obviously the business had changed, and, and, and you've talked about how disgusted you were with the changes, but you wrestled a lot of different guys at the time, like Randy Savage and Paul Orndorff, Roddy Piper, are guys that come off the top of my head, and I know Paul Orndorff, I've had him on the show here, and he had nothing but great things to say about wrestling you and the respect that he had wrestling you. Um, what do you remember? Was there any one guy that you particularly remember wrestling during that time period that you enjoyed more than the other guys? It was a, a, a hard time for me because I had retired four years before. I absolutely wanted no more wrestling because uh, – uh, I'm still having a lot of uh, aches and pains, which the, the, the surgeries followed after all that, that I started having the three very major back surgeries and hip surgeries and knee surgery. So I, I, I was, you know, I, I absolutely wanted no part of wrestling, but uh, it's a long story which I won't go into, but because my son was was there at the time and McMahon asked me to put the tights back on and I absolutely refused, and I guess they told my kid, you know, it's too bad your father won't put on the tights because if he did, could be a good boost for you, this and that. And so I don't want it to be said uh, that uh, my son to ever say that uh, he, he might have had a break, but because of me, he did not because mm -hmm. I wouldn't cooperate. So with those things, I put the tights on. Very reluctantly, I hated it, didn't, didn't want no part of it, but I did. And then when we'd have a couple tag team matches here and there, uh, then uh, when that would be over, I'd strictly do commentating again, and David would be right back in the opening matches and that, and he would get frustrated, angry, disgusted, and he would uh, leave. He, he didn't want no part of it. So McMahon knew that, I think, in, uh, the way I figured it, McMahon knew that uh, he would want to come back, and so he could take advantage by asking me to wrestle so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so, because if I'd refuse, then obviously... Uh, I wouldn't be able to get David back. And I kept right. telling him, you know, either make up your mind whether you're going to put up with this or just get out completely. But uh, that's why I hated it so much, because I was caught in a situation where, uh, that I'd never been into before. And so I wrestled guys like uh, Roddy Piper, and I wrestled uh, oh, Orndorff. I didn't mind, because Orndorff was a, a heck of a guy. I mean, he was uh, impressive, and he hard worker, and he, he, and he, he I mean, he, this guy was always in shape, you know, there was no, no disgrace in wrestling <laughs> with Paul Orndorff, yeah. but he had to wrestle, God rest his soul, Adrian Adonis, and Savage, and, uh, and different people, and I didn't want no part of it at the time, so that, I, I, I hate it very, very much, that part, and finally I just said, that's it, I'm, I'm leaving, you know, I saw all of what was going on, like I said, with the drugs and all that kind of stuff, and I said, I don't want to be associated with anything like this anymore, and I left. Um, may, I, may I tell you another little thing that I'd I like to clear up? Oh, yeah, you can tell me anything you want. <laughs> Recently, somebody, uh, I don't know if you know a guy named Chris Cruz, very knowledgeable about yes. the wrestling business and that. He sent me something from the Internet that somebody wrote, and actually, I don't, know, I don't think the name appeared of the person who wrote. But uh, it's, it's amazing how people can distort history. Uh, how they can uh, come up, uh, and you wonder, where did this come from? And let me tell you what I'm talking about. Okay. You know, the first eight years that I was champion, okay, I was on a ridiculous schedule where I would wrestle seven days one week and six days the following week. And the reason why I was wrestling seven days twice uh, a month and, tw and twice a month I would wrestle six days because when I left Canada and I came back and I was the champion. Now, I had promised Frank Tommy, who, had, who I had great, great respect for in Toronto, that I would wrestle for him at the Maple Leaf Garden every second Sunday. I wanted to keep my word to him because Frank had been very good to me in the year and a half that I had spent in Canada. 
And so, uh, and so I, I followed it, but it was tough because wrestling every day, especially in those days, Eric, the rings we had were those boxing rings. Wow. They were like concrete. It's not like the trampoline-like rings that they have today. Wow. Those rings were hard. And when you're taking pounding every night, that really can do a number on your body. Well, anyway... Uh, you know, year after year, and I was the type of guy, and anybody who knows me, Eric, will tell you this, never mind the painkiller. I wouldn't even take an aspirin. I would never take nothing because right. I don't believe in that. And so, you know, as the, 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 as the uh, injuries piled on and, and the, the, the hurting was, was more and more, after about seven years or, or before seven years, I said to McMahon, I don't think I can go on much longer. My body needs a rest. I need to heal. I'm hurting from head to toe. I got to get out. He stalled me for close to a year. Then I let him know that I was going to get out. Not to retire, Eric. A lot of people think I was retiring. Not to retire. I wanted to heal my body because I was hurting too much. Gotcha. So anyway, then came in the um, Koloff thing, and then the Koloff. Uh, with Pedro, as uh, Pedro followed. The story this guy writes, oh, well, let me tell you first what happened. After about two years, McMahon, st- uh, and I loved the business again, because what I was doing, after I healed pretty well, I had I rested up. I, I, I really took time. Then I started loving the business again because everybody, all the promoters n- knew that I was free now. Yeah. I would go to Paul Bosch down in Texas for a shot. I'd go to St. Louis quite a bit for Sam Mushnick. Uh, but if I'd wrestle twice a week, I would take off the rest of the week. I might wrestle two days this week and be off all week. Next week I might wrestle three days and be off four. Next week I might wrestle one day and, and then I take the rest of the week. I'd go to Japan for two weeks and I would take two weeks off. I loved the business, man. This was great. Then McMahon started calling me. Bruno, he said, you know, and I said, no, Vince, I'll wrestle for you. You want me to make a shot in the garden or Boston or Philadelphia, anywhere? Be happy to. But that's it. That's it. And now they wanted me to go for the title again. Mm. And I don't want no part of that because I was doing very well. I was going to California. I, you know, I, 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 it's my pace. So finally, he and Junior, the guy that's running it now, they asked me to have a meeting at the airport. We met at the airport. And he said to me, Bruno, please, he says, come back for one year. And after the one year, he said, you can retire or do whatever, he says, and give us plenty of time to really get, find somebody who can really take over that spot. Yeah. I, he said, look, you're wrestling a couple of days a week now, two, three days a week. He says, that's all you'll do here, too. He says, because we're only going to use you for the major clubs, none of the secondary clubs like you used to do before. Just the major club, you won't wrestle more than two or three times a week at, at the most. I thought, well, I'm doing that now anyway, and if that's going to help them to find the Mr. Wright, great. And so I agreed. Of course, as you know, one year went to two, two went to three, yeah. then on the fourth year is when I break my neck. But here's what I'm getting at. In this article on the Internet that somebody wrote, they said that uh, when I won the title, because I, I wanted out to rest or because of whatever, but I made a deal before I left that no matter who was champion, more or less, that when I was healed and everything else, that I was uh, to be given that title back, which is nothing further from the truth. I uh, Heck, I didn't want that. The, uh, McMahon asked me time and again, and like I said at, 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 at the airport meeting, you know, he promised me just two, three times for one year. Uh, and so they said that Pedro was the champion, but because of the deal that I'd made with McMahon and wanted the belt back, the title back, that that more or less Pedro paid the price, that even though he was doing well, mm-hmm. that he was dumped. And, uh, and my God, that is so bizarre and even funny. And I read these things, and I say, where does this come <laughs> from? I mean, it's, they, how, you know, it's, it's just ridiculous. But anyway, I just read recently, I read all that. And I don't know how many people saw that on the Internet, but in case they did, I'm telling you that that's ridiculous, and, and what I just told you is exactly what happened. Wow, and we're getting the, the true story here from Bruno San Martino. Bruno, you know, I was watching um, some tapes, I, I don't know, maybe it was a couple of months ago, and um, it was one of your, your last matches you did commentary for when you did uh, commentary with uh, Jesse the Body and uh, Vince. And yes. I remember watching the, the, the tape and thinking to myself, you really didn't talk much at the time. Were you just so fed up with everything that you just wanted to get the heck out of there when you were done? 
You hit the nail right on the head. <laughs> I just I just couldn't have my mind into it. I just hated I hated being there. I hated the whole thing. I just I just, just was if you remember me if you go back far enough when I used to do the commentating back in 78 79 McMahon, I, you, you see that I was a different commentator, yes. color commentator than I was at, at the time you're talking about. Because with everything that was going on in that, my heart just was not in it at all, and I just didn't want to be there. I just didn't want to be there. Okay, okay. And, uh, you know, being from Pittsburgh, I have to ask you about Kurt Angle, Pittsburgh native, um, you know, one of the, the more uh, famous wrestlers to come out of Pittsburgh, um, you know, over the last uh, decade. Uh, what are your thoughts on Kurt? Well, in fact, I just did a television show with him. There's a television show here in Pittsburgh called Night Talk. It's a one-hour television show. It comes on 8 o'clock from 8 till 9. And uh, they asked me if I would do that show. They were going to have Kurt. Uh, you know, I don't see Kurt very, very much at all. Once in a blue, blue moon uh, when we see uh, uh, each other, you know, like we did in that show. He's very respectful, and I certainly respect everything that he has done in that. Are we great friends? No. He, 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 you know, he, he's younger, a lot younger. In fact, he tells a story, which is flattering. He says that uh, when he was about eight years old, his dad took him to the Civic Arena. I think he said I was wrestling Zabisco. And he says that that's what inspired him to take up uh, wrestling mm. after he saw uh, uh, me and, uh, and Zabisco in the ring. And that's when he wanted to join the school in wrestling in school. And he, and he said right on the air that that's what uh, got him uh, uh, going into wrestling, amateur, which then, of course, is coming to professional wrestling. But as far as, like, really no Kurt to uh, spend time with him or anything yeah. like that, I really didn't know. I, I, you know, I knew his great amateur background and won the Olympics, and, and then he went into the pros, and, and uh, I, he did very well, I understand. But this, but. Just, you know, but that's it. I, I don't know him personally like like a pal around with him <laughs> or spend time with him or yeah. anything like that. I really, you know, I just know him. I appeared on a show to with him, but that's about it. Okay. Have uh, ha Has TNA Wrestling contacted you over the last couple of years about making any kind of appearances? Who's that, T and TNA? Yeah. No, they have never contacted me for anything. No. Oh, oh okay. Um, Andre the Giant, he's a guy I've um, had a lot of the guys talk about over the years on the show, and some guys like him, and then there are other guys that hated him. Uh, what do you remember about Andre? Well, I always got I always got along real good with Andre. You know, I, I, you, when you say some guys like him, some guys didn't like me, you talk, you're talking about fellow wrestlers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, he... I don't know what to say on that. I got along with Andre uh, very, very well, and I know he liked me because he used to call me uh, whenever we'd be in the same area and he'd say, hey, Bruno, he says, how about we go to eat <laughs> or how about we have a beer or something like that. He was always uh, uh, very, very friendly. I know he got along real well with Danucci, but I think he didn't, get, he didn't like or get along with a lot of the newer guys that came around. Uh, that's at least what I heard. Can I tell you that I actually saw <laughs> myself firsthand? No, but uh, but I've heard those things as well. But you know, I I don't know too much what went on or why or anything like that. But I know he a few times he made remarks about uh, a lot of the guys, and he too remarked about uh, the drugs and stuff like that. And he didn't seem to have much respect for the guys that he knew that were doing much of that. You know. Gotcha. Did you see the wrestler, the movie, the wrestler? You know what? Uh, my son Danny had a friend who gave him a DVD of it, and uh -huh. uh, he brought it home. I didn't want to see it. He says, come on, Dad. He says, just look at it. And I did look at it, and, I, and I'm not going to lie to you, Eric. I heard so much about it, the big comeback for, what's his name? Uh, Mickey you, Rourke. You know, you, you were, yeah, because I watched the movie, and between you and I, and a lot of people will disagree with me, and that's 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 fine, that's right, because everybody's entitled to their opinion. I thought it was garbage. I, I, I don't know what the big fuss was about that movie. Yeah. I thought it was a lousy movie. Yeah. I really did. Yeah. Uh, when, when you run, I mean, I guess playing off of the theme for the wrestler, are you surprised when you run into guys that, that you wrestled with in your day 
and they're still, uh, you know, uh, living paycheck to paycheck, still taking wrestling bookings. And you're one of the guys that, you know, people hold up as a model that says, yeah, you can get out of the wrestling business with dignity and have a life after wrestling financially and, and, and do so proudly. D- does it surprise you sometimes when you see guys, um, you know, from your era or guys that you've wrestled with still needing to wrestle in the wrestle- wrestling business? Well, but keep in mind what I said in the beginning, Eric, and that's a fact. That in in uh, in the guys that are of my era, you know, in those days, nobody made a lot yeah. of money. You really didn't. So a lot of the guys that uh, are doing this to still make a living, it's not because they were necessarily fools who made a lot of money and they threw it away. It's because a lot of them, you know, uh, you know, uh, I don't, you know, I don't know what people consider big money, but let me throw some numbers at you. I know, for example, in the 60s, guys were making twenty five, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year. If, look, at, I was considered one of the big money makers. In fact, they had me, Willie Mays, and Mickey Mantle in Sports Illustrated as among the top money earners. And you know what the top money earners were? I'm going back to 1965, I think it was. Okay. It was between 100 and 125000 a year. Don't misunderstand. In that time, that was good money. It was yeah. really good money. But it's not the 5, 10, 15, 20 million <laughs> that you're hearing about guys making today. Yeah. And, and there were very few guys who were making that kind of money. You know what I mean? Sure. Very few. Yeah, I tried to save money because I knew that this could all end. I had, had that very tough, humble beginning in my life. I know all about poverty and, and uh, hiding in those mountains and going without food and, and all that kind of stuff. So I tried my best to always put away some. But keep in mind, uh, unlike Mickey Mann or Willie Mays that I mentioned, a wrestler had to pay his own expense. Mm. Remember that if I made 100000 let's say, and, and Mickey and Willie made 100000 uh, remember that those guys, when they, their hotel was paid for, their food was paid for, their travel was paid for. Yeah. Bruno San Martino was considered to be in that same. Uh, he had to pay for his own hotel. He had to pay for his own food, and not for all of his travel, but a, a, a bit, some of his travel. And then you have a family at home that you have to support. So you know, uh, in my case, I will tell you that I I, tr- I don't have money to burn by any means. But I'm, but I'm well enough that I tried to give, help my kids out to get an education and that. And my wife and I, um, uh, we we're comfortable. You know, I don't uh, need. Uh, I, I like to make appearances now and then because uh, it's fun. I yeah. don't do too many. I might do seven, maybe eight in a year, if that many even, uh, because you get to see some uh, the fans for one thing. Okay, I, I've never killed myself, and I think I told you this before. I have never been a guy who believed that I was a superstar in my day because I was such a great talent or because I was so great or so super. Uh, I, I always felt that, I, that, that, thank God, whatever the fans saw in me, they would buy a ticket to come and see me. But they are responsible for you being a so-called star or being a success. Without the fans, you're nothing. You're nobody. They make you or break you. Because you know what? If I'm made a headliner today, and if I don't draw, if people don't come to see me, I go back to being a preliminary yeah. in the wrestling business. That's the way it works. So the fans are the ones that make you. So sometimes in, I find out in these appearances that you do have an opportunity to show the fans your gratitude for their support through the years and what have you. And I truly respect and love my fans, and I always want them to know you know, how much I respect and appreciate them. And sometimes it's fun to do these appearances and, and get to talk to uh, the fans and, uh, and, and let them know what you think. And I do enjoy that. Okay. Uh, as we wrap up here, uh, at the end of my show every week, I always – kind of run down this day in history and I kind of read off what happened on this day in history and wrestling and I kind of give my two cents if it was something I saw or watched or read about. Um, what I'd like to do today, if it's okay with you, I have a couple of dates here as I look back in the history of Bruno San Martino on this day in wrestling history and if I can read off some dates and if you could throw in some comments whether you have uh, one sentence to say about uh, a particular match or whether you want to expand on it, it's up to you but if, if that's all right I think we can have some fun with that. Sure. All right, excellent. Okay. Well, on this day in Bruno San Martino history in 1963, Bruno, you were in Perth Amboy, New Jersey, wrestling Brute Bernard. 
Oh my God! I know I don't remember that. Where's <laughs> <laughs> the <damn> boy? <laughs> yeah. Okay. On this day in Bruno San Martino history, in 1965, you were at the Maple Leaf Gardens as world champion, and you defeated Johnny Powers by a countout. Oh, is that right? Okay. Well, I remember seeing wrestling powers in Canada, but I uh, can't say I just remember because I wrestled him a number of times in different places. But this was at the Maple Leaf Garden? Yes. Okay. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you I remember that <laughs> clearly. I don't. Yeah. And, and even if you don't remember the matches, if you remember something about these guys or any kind oh. of a, a fun story. Yeah, well, yeah, Bruce Bernard was, you know, Scott Murphy's tag team partner. He was a big bruiser guy, about 275 pounds, shaved head like I am now. <laughs> and he was, uh, you know, he was a tough guy. He really was and uh, moved well and everything else. Yeah, I wrestled him a number of times. Yeah. Uh, not quite. Johnny Powers was a hated guy. He had that arrogance about <laughs> him that people just loved to boom. He had that bleached blonde at the time when he had this, some hair. And uh, he had real fancy, like almost like a strip tights on and and what have you and uh, he just uh, he just had a way of uh, uh, coming in, in the ring with the, with everything about him that people just hated him <laughs> on this day in 1966 in Asbury Park New Jersey you defeated Baron Mikel Sakuna in a title match yeah, well, Baron Cicluna, I heard a lot of people, I guess, who saw him in later years, and they said, well, was he really ever a headliner? Cicluna was a great opponent. I used to have some great, great matches with Baron Cicluna. Asbury Park, I'm not going to tell you I remember that <laughs> match. I, I remember a match in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware with him. Ah. Well, I remember that match because it was a really great match, and we broke the rink. But anyway, but he was he was he was good, very good. Okay, and here's one I'd love to get your take on. As I, I found this today on this day in your history in 1967 at the Cow Palace in San Francisco, you defended the WWF title against their U.S. champion Ray Stevens. And it says here in the record books that he beat you in a two out of three falls match, that he, he beat you one fall, you beat him the next fall, and then he beat you by a count out in the last fall, but the title didn't change hands. Yeah, we were both out, on the last fall, we were both outside the ring, and actually I was jumping in the ring before him. <laughs> he grabbed me by the tights. The count was, I forget what the count was, but when he grabbed me by the tights and yanked me off of that apron where I fell on my back, he jumped in the ring <laughs> and just beat the count, and that's how that count out came. But no, the title doesn't go on that. But we had just wrestled either the time before that or the time after that, I don't remember which, where we also had a one-hour long match. Oh, okay. And we, we sold that place out, and we had a great match. Ray Stevens was a great, great performer. Wow. On this day in your history, uh, close to home in 1968 in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, you as world champion defeated Captain Lou Albano and Tony Altamori uh, in a handicap match. Wow, where was this at? In Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, near near your home, I would imagine. <laughs> oh, my goodness, I don't even remember that one. I really don't. <laughs> oh, wow. On this day in 1974 at the Capitol Center in Landover, Maryland, you defeated Nikolai Volkov. Oh, okay. Well, I wrestled Koloff uh, a lot of times in a lot of different arenas, including Man Madison Square Garden. Mm. But I honestly, I can't say that I remember <laughs> that one. Wow. Uh, well, speak sorry. Oh, that's okay. Speaking of the Garden, uh, not quite on this day, but on June sixteenth, uh, June sixteenth. Uh, I'm sorry, July sixteenth, nineteen seventy-five. You pinned Waldo von Erich in Madison Square Garden on this day, and we mentioned earlier Waldo had just recently passed away. What do you remember about Waldo? I, what I remember about Waldo, it's a shame that today when I read about the greats of yesteryear and they mention all these great guys that, that deserve all the mention and credit, but guys like Waldo Von Eric, you never hear, and in my opinion, uh, I wrestled him so many times throughout the, not only the United States but in Canada as well, and even in Australia I wrestled him. Uh, I think he was, a, 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 he was a tremendous, tremendous guy in that ring, and it's a shame that he doesn't get the recognition. Uh, another guy doesn't get the recognition he deserved was Bobby Duncombe, another great, mm. great wrestler 
that I never hear their names come up, and it makes me feel kind of bad because I know how great they really were. Yeah, and uh, finally, um, not quite on this day, but on July 17th, it's the closest one I could find on this day, in 1987 at the Nassau Coliseum, you were the special referee in a match between Ken Patera and Hercules. I don't know what you remember about those special referee gigs uh, as you were winding up in 87. In 1987? Yes, Oh, uh, my goodness. Well, see, that was that uh, period uh, when I, uh, you know, when I was back with the Junior, right? When right. When doing commentate. Yeah, see, I told you that was a dark period <laughs> <laughs> in my wrestling life. <laughs> and I really honestly can't say that I remember that one either. Although you're talking about a guy that I have tremendous respect for, and that's Kenny Patera. Wow. Kenny Patera was a great, great athlete. You know, he was in the Olympic Games twice, once in weightlifting competition, another time he went as a shot putter, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and he was a great college player all the way. I, he, this, this guy was a tremendous, tremendous athlete and always had the greatest respect for him. Wow, he was trying to get anything out of you. You know, he wanted you to wrestle a team. Now he's throwing you out there to referee. He's, he's trying to get you out there any way he can. Huh? Yeah, he did. He really <laughs> did. He was getting me to do all kinds of stuff, and uh, and I and I hated it all. That's why I guess I don't remember a lot of it because when people told me is that as part of my career, I said no. My career ended in 1981. Yeah. What took place after that had nothing to do with my career. I tell people. All right. You know, I I know it was. Uh, you know, not 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 your. Um, you don't have fond memories of that time, but I got to tell you. For somebody like me, you know, as a wrestling fan and, you know, as a kid, teenager, you know, I just missed you as a wrestling fan. I just started watching wrestling in 1982, so it was oh. really it was really a great thing, even though, and I know you weren't very fond of that time, but it was a great thing for guys like me, you know, to be able to catch you um, live at least once, you know, as a wrestling fan. Well, but too bad you couldn't catch me in the <laughs> 60s when I was really in my prime. I was 275 pounds. I didn't have any physical ailments of any kind and not bragging but I felt yeah. like I was strong as a horse and I felt like a, I could uh, go against a truck and knock it out of the road uh, of course you're very young and uh, strong and that but you find out as time goes that you're not <laughs> quite that tough <laughs> that in fact you're pretty fragile as you watch your body uh, uh, you start getting banged around and <laughs> Oh, well. Oh, my. Well, Bruno, uh, you know, as always, I mean, it is just always an honor and a pleasure. I, you know, I, I love having you on the show. It's, it, it's such a, always such a great time. And like I was telling you before, when I do interviews on other shows promoting my show and my website and things like that, you're the first person they ask me about. The people just love you out there, and I can't thank you enough uh, over the years, over the last 10 and a half, 11 years coming on my show and just being uh, such a great guest. You're, uh, you're, you're just unbelievable, Bruno. You're great. Well, I'm, fl I'm flattered that the, that the fans ask about me or uh, react with my name. And, uh, Eric, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I always enjoy doing the show with you. You're great at it, and I truly, truly have a, a lot of fun every time we do this show, and I hope we can do it again. Oh, absolutely. And, again, let me give that website out. It's www dot wrestling riot online dot com and that is where you can grab bruno sammartino's autobiography with some new stuff in it bruno uh again always a pleasure and we'll definitely do this again uh in the very near future and i just want to thank you again thanks again bruno and uh best of luck to you thank you very much eric and the best to you as well thank all you all right thanks bruno have a good night okay bye-bye bye-bye that was the legendary Bruno Sammartino. And, uh, you know, I don't mince words here. In the 10 and a half, 11 years that I've been doing this show, there is no other guest that people ask me about more than Bruno Sammartino. And I've been lucky enough to have all the great ones on the radio show over that, that course of time. And yet Bruno's name constantly comes up. And I always joke with friends of mine in the wrestling business that I say, you know, here I am, a guy in my 30s, and I've had the opportunity to network and talk to all these great wrestling superstars over the last uh, decade or so. And Bruno Sammartino, out of everybody, a guy, um, you know, arguably the greatest of all time in his 70s is a guy that I've developed a closer friendship with than anybody. And uh, it's just amazing to me. And, you know, I, I still get, uh, you know, the chills whenever I get him on the phone. And uh, just what a legend. And I had the opportunity 
uh, about a year, year and a half ago or so, I'm not, not quite sure of the day, I had a, a chance about a year and a half or so to actually sit down and physically meet Bruno for the first time. I did a shoot interview with him for RF Video, and uh, before the interview I arrived, and we talked for about an hour just uh, catching up because it was the first time in uh, 10 years that we had actually met physically, and uh, it was just uh, such a, an honor and a pleasure, and there was no way in the world that you would know that Bruno San Martino is in his 70s because the man is still in phenomenal, phenomenal shape. Uh, I remember Bobby Heenan at one convention, he was calling him Bruno Goldberg because uh, Bruno, you know, he's, he uh, wears a, a bald head and a goatee, but, I mean, he's still pretty jacked, you know, for a guy in his 70s. And, uh, you know, not that I'm Bruno's business manager, but I always tell him, I say, Bruno, you're missing the boat. you got to do one of these uh, exercise tapes for senior citizens. But then again, I don't see many senior citizens doing curls with uh, 25 or 40-pound uh, dumbbells at the same time. Well, I'm going to wrap things up. I hope you enjoyed tonight's show. I hope you enjoyed uh, this day in Bruno San Martino history. I thought that was a lot of fun, especially having him on the air and talk about those great moments in Bruno's history. Uh, a couple of quick plugs. Uh, you're listening to the show live on TVbydemand.com. That's TVbydemand.com. The show airs live every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We start at 7 and we end. Well, whenever we end, that's when we end. But that is live every Wednesday night on TVbydemand.com. And we also have a chat room that we run that we run during the radio show in which you can come in and ask questions and join in the wrestling chat with, uh, with, with, with some great listeners that have come in over the last couple of months. And that is TVbydemand.com. If you missed any of today's episode with Bruno San Martino, I will have the entire episode uncut and uncensored on my website, ProWrestlingRadio.com. That is ProWrestlingRadio.com. You can either listen to it uh, through the website or you can download it to your desktop through the website. It will also be available on iTunes.com. Just go in the podcast section and look for Pro Wrestling Radio. My blog is www.camelclutchblog.com. That's www.camelclutchblog.com. And that is where I write about wrestling and MMA and just about anything else uh, about five to seven days a week. Lately, we've been doing seven days a week, and I have a plethora of writers that contribute all kinds of great stuff. John contributes some phenomenal video gaming columns. Uh, Jeff from the Wheelhouse, he's going to have a column looking at the Midway baseball season in the next 24 to 48 hours. I have a column up there today, which I'll tell you, I'm getting a lot, a lot of um, response to. And that is a column looking at mixed martial arts, their fans, and the reaction they have they have had to what has happened with Brock Lesnar following his UFC 100 victory over Frank Muir. And quite honestly, I think there are a bunch of babies, and that's what I call it. And I've been duking it out with those MMA fans uh, all over the Internet all day today, and that is over at CamelClutchBlog.com. And I also, for you wrestling fans out there, I have a two-part series looking at the greatest wrestling matches that never happened, wrestling dream matches that never had the opportunity to take place between guys from different eras, guys that have passed away. But I take a look at that in two parts on CamelClutchBlog.com. You're also listening to the show on Error FM Radio. Dot com that is errorfm.com errorfm radio that is errorfm.com and that is thursday nights on tape delay well that will about do it for me and next week i'm not quite sure who will have as a guest i may decide to just take open lines with all of the post ufc 100 fallout and all the fallout from seth green and zz top uh, guest hosting on raw and all the latest news we'll see what happens we'll play it by year but you can find out first on Pro 